All right, we're wrapping up the book of 1 Corinthians here, chapter number 16. There is a, a bunch of things uh, in this chapter, but we're only going to be hitting a few of the main points. And so let's dig right into this. In verse number 1, here we just read, 1 Corinthians 16, the Bible reads, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So in the next few verses, he's going to give a commandment about taking up a collection for the saints. Now, we're going to go into much more detail just about this one point. There's not very many places in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that go into handling of money, you know, within the church. There are definitely some, it's not like it's never talked about, but there's not very many that talk about this. So what we're going to look at today, we're going to be dealing with this form of collection for the saints. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that what, what we do in here is, it says, uh, we'll look at verse number two. It says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So what the Apostle Paul is telling him here is that, hey, as a church, take up an offering, take up a gathering of money. Take this up, you know, like on the first day of the week when you gather together, when you come together for church, gather up a collection for the saints. Now, it wasn't for the saints at that church. Obviously, he was going to send it off to Jerusalem. That is where the money was going to support people, to support the saints in Jerusalem. Now, this is very similar to what we do with our collection on Wednesday nights. Our collection on Wednesday nights is taken up and gathered, and it's segregated from the, from the rest of our tithes and offerings that we collect on Sundays for the sole purpose of being able to supply the needs of of other saints, of people who are out doing the work and the ministry of the Lord, um, which we, we call missionaries, right? People that will go out, they're willing to, to dedicate their life to serving God, and oftentimes we support the missionaries that are going out to other countries. And the reason being is because when you're going to another country, it could be very difficult to be able to support yourself, especially, you know, Americans are going out to other countries. It may be much more difficult for them to find jobs and to effectively uh, preach the gospel. And ultimately, the money is given so that they could dedicate themselves completely to serving the Lord so that they don't have to have a job and worry about providing for their family in addition to reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and hopefully get churches started. And it makes perfect sense. And this is something, and I'm not going to prove this from the scripture tonight. There's plenty of scripture that talks about it, that the, the labor is worthy of his reward. And there's, there's plenty of examples. And this is one example right here of him saying, hey, we're going to take a collection up and this is going to go towards the saints in Jerusalem that need help. Apparently at that time, they, they had a need. They had a need that needed to be filled. So he's asking the church at Corinth, hey, before I get there, because he's not going to make a big show out of everything, just let everybody know so that they could lay in store as God has prospered them, right? And this is, let's just keep reading here. Look at verse number two. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. Now the word liberality, you know, in today's usage of the word liberal, we have a, we have a, a poor taste in our mouth for the word liberal, right? It's, it's, you think of just extreme left-wing liberal, right? But the word liberal itself is not a bad word. It's not, it's not a curse word. It's not anything. It's actually a good word. Liberality is, is, is where you're more free, right? Your liberality is, I'm opening up, in this case, my wealth, and, and, and I'm being liberal with it. I'm not being stingy. I'm, I'm being... Um, Generous is the word. Generous or free, right? And you're being very liberal with, with your hospitality and, and being willingness to help other people. So he's saying that he's going to send their liberality like, as much as they're willing to give. Now, keep in mind, this is also a free will offering. This is not a tithe. This is different. There are, there are different types of offerings that you can give. You can give either like what's known as alms or a free will offering to just to help support people, which is where this is going which is separate from the tithe. 
Now, turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9, because this, um, this same exact concept here of collection for the saints, he goes into even more in 2 Corinthians. Now, if you want to take notes, if you want to look into this even more at home, you can read all of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Because they both chapters really dig into this a lot. And I, and I was going to go into it, but it's just too much scripture for one evening. I've got other points within 1 Corinthians chapter 16 that I want to get to. So I can't dedicate the entire sermon to this tonight. Although it definitely is a subject that you could invest an entire sermon on. On just giving and being supportive to other ministries and to, and to people doing the work of God. But we're going to start looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse number one, the Bible says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. He's saying that, you know, the ministering to the saints, the giving, right, working for, helping out the saints, ministering to them. He says, I don't even really need to write to you. It's super superfluous for me to write unto you. For I know, verse number two, I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, saying, I know how good you are with this. It's superfluous for me to write it. I know how good you are with ministering to saints. He says, I boast of you to them of Macedonia. He says, I brag on you guys. You know, when, when, I'm, when I'm at the church in Macedonia, I'm saying, yeah, those, those Corinthians, they really know how to, how to support their missionaries and how to help them out and, and, and are there to supply every want and every need. It says that Achaia was ready a year ago and your zeal hath provoked very many. Verse 3, yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. So he's saying, but I still sent brethren there ahead of time to let you know, you know, he's like, I don't want our boasting to be in vain. I want to give you guys some opportunity here to get your, your stuff in order. Because, I mean, think about it. If you know in advance, hey, I'm going to save up a little bit in the coming weeks before Paul gets here, before, you know, that we're going to send out our offering to these saints, it gives you opportunity to save a little here and save a little there and kind of save up and then say, okay, here, now I'm ready to give. And he's giving them this heads up, if, as it were. That's why he said, I've sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready. Because let's face it, I mean, if you, anybody who, who knows how to manage finances at all, you need to be able to budget, you need to be able to, to be ready in how you're going to spend your money. So here's an opportunity. So this opportunity arises. We're going to need some help from you. Other saints need help. So I'm letting you know right now so you can get things ready, so you can make all the collection. We don't have to do any work towards this. And it's just sitting there ready to go so when I show up, we could send it out to Jerusalem. But this is in 2 Corinthians. So look at verse number 4 in chapter 9. Lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. So he's saying like, you know, we've been bragging about you to the Macedonians and we don't want some of the people from Macedonia to come then and they find you not ready and then there's no, you know, like, you're not giving anything and he's like, you know, that would be a shame that, that we were speaking so highly of you and now you just kind of failed is what, he's, is what he's explained to him here. Look at verse number five. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty whereof ye had notice before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Excuse me. And this is the exact same example that, and, and it goes into more detail here. That's why we're looking at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It's the same type of thing. He's, he's giving them notice. He's saying, hey, get this stuff together. We're, we, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to, to help out these other saints. And it's not covetousness. It's not based on greed or anything like that. He says, it's just a matter of bounty. And it, look what it says here in verse number six. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now, this is a, this is a concept that should be very easy to understand. When you think about sowing seed, you're sowing plants, you're sowing maybe vegetables in your garden or whatever. If you're only putting out a few seeds, 
You're sowing sparingly. You're only putting, well, I'm going to put one seed here and one seed here, as opposed to just taking handfuls and just going boom, 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 right? I mean, when you do a little bit here and there, you can't get a huge return. You're only going to get as much as you're putting out. If that, right? You're in, when you sow, not every seed germinates and takes root and comes up. You, you, you lose some. Not, not all of them will come up and bear fruit. So you want to be able to get as much seed out as possible in order to yield, have, have a great yield, right? Have, have a great return, have a lot of fruit to come back to you. And he's likening this sowing to their giving and supplying the needs of the people who are literally going out and sowing the seed of God, sowing the word of God in people's hearts. Look at verse number um, 7. Continuing on here, it says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And we'll just keep reading here. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of of your righteousness. And this is where he's tying it all together in verse number 10, saying that, you know, if you're ministering the seed to the sower, right? You got a sower, you got a guy that's willing to put in the work and the labor. I'm going to go sow the seed, but I need to be supplied with the seed to go out and, and do the sowing, right? I'll put in all the labor, I'll put in all the work, I'm going to go out into the field, I'm going to do all this work, but I need someone to help supply the seed unto me. And that's exactly what we're doing when we're giving our offerings to the missionaries. The missionary is the one who said, I will be the laborer. I will go out and work for Christ. I will dedicate my whole life to just going out, preaching the gospel, helping people get founded, maybe helping churches get started. I am willing to do that labor and that work. Not everyone's willing to do that. So when we find people like that, let's say, hey, we'll help you out. Hey, let's give you some seed to go out and sow. We'll help you out. We'll give you some Bibles. We'll help pay for your food so you don't have to worry about getting a job and working on this. And we will help to supply you to do all of that work. And the more we can give them to sow, the bigger bounty they're going to get in return, the bigger spiritual bounty they're going to get, the, bigger, uh, f the more fruit that's going to be produced as a result of that. This scenario in 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 are all dealing with the collection for these saints who are doing this work, who are sowing the seed and doing that type of operation. And it's being sent away. You notice in 1 Corinthians 16, as well as in 2 Corinthians 9, he mentions it's being gathered to be given away to other people, which is what we do with our mission. When we send it away to other people, it does not get used up here within our church. That is what this specific collection is for. And it's, that's what our Wednesday night collection is for. It's for the saints that labor and travail in the word and are sowing the seed. And notice he said there in, um, in verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart. It's up to you whether or not you want to give it all, how much you want to give. It's completely up to you. This is not compelled whatsoever. It's just a matter of knowing, hey, there's a need here. They're willing to do some work, but they can only do as much as, as they can. So let's pool together some money. Let's see what we can do to help out as a church. And it's completely up to you what you purpose in your heart. And notice this, it says, so let them give, not grudgingly or of necessity. Don't feel like you have to do this. When we pass around, our, when we take up a collection on Wednesday night, we pass around an offering plate. Don't feel like you have to do that. God doesn't want you just thinking like, you know, if you just, just feel like you're forced to give, that's not, that, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. It's, you do not have to 
put anything in this plate when we're, when we're it, it's supposed to be given out of love. It's not grudging like, oh man, I really need this money. I don't, you know, like, but I guess I'll, I'll, I'll give some. Then don't, don't give it at all. I'll tell you that if you feel like that, don't even give any money. Don't do it. God loves a cheerful giver. If you decide that whatever it is that you have to give a little bit extra, maybe God's blessed you and you, have, you got a little bonus, you have a little bit extra money you didn't know you had, you should be happy to say, hey, I want to help these people. I want, I want God's work to be done. And even if it's just a little bit, you know, a little bit can go a long way. God can multiply things. Think about the, the, the story of the, the feeding of the 5,000 and the, and the feeding of the 4,000 and, he, you know, with five fishes and two, you know, or five, five uh, loaves of bread and two fishes, like God multiplied that. He multiplied a little bit and made it go really far and, and, and do a lot of work and even just a little bit of money. It's not like God needs money. Obviously, we need money to do things in this, in this earth, but God can, can stretch things and make it go a long way. And if you purpose in your heart to, to, give, um, to give for this, then that's great, and that's what um, we should be doing. And don't feel like it has to be of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. And it's having that type of grace and that heart to help out these people. Now, we ought to have a heart that wants to help out the work for the Lord, right? I mean, that only makes sense. It's not that you have to give money, but you ought to have a, a desire to help those that are laboring for the Lord. And we're going to get into that a little bit too. Um, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter number 6. Because this giving is totally vo voluntary. It's just like giving alms. And it's important to have this understanding because there's different teachings that are out there today about tithing, about giving, and I, you know, a lot of people, or no, I don't know about a lot, some people will teach that a tithe is completely unnecessary in the New Testament, it's only an Old Testament commandment, and I am totally in disagreement with that. I believe that the tithe continues into the New Testament. I tithe. I have tithed for a very, very long time since I got back into church. I would do my tithe, and I believe that it's that is something that is compulsory, that is required, that God demands of us. Is that whatever you are taking in, He requires a tenth of our increase. I believe that, and um, I'm not going to prove that completely, 100%. But I am going to give you some reasons for why I believe that tonight. I've, I've preached entire, dedicated entire sermons to that. But um, first I want to look at alms because oftentimes people will turn to chapters like 2 Corinthians 9 where it says, oh, you know, you don't have to give grudgingly or of necessity. And they'll say, see, and, and they'll use that to say if it's a tithe, the tithe is something you have to do. Well, this isn't a tithe. What we saw in 2 Corinthians 9, this is like the missionary money that we send off to just help and support other people that are pre doing God's work. Other saints that are in need outside of your local church that are just doing work for God that, that have come across the need, that is what that offering and that collection was for. And it's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 16. That was the purpose for that collection. But that, the purpose of that collection was not for the tithe at all because the purpose for the tithe is to provide meat for, for the workers in God's house. And that will be for the local church, for the local assembly. The, the tithes go to support what we have going on here to, to, to help pay the rent, to keep the lights on, to provide refreshments, to be able to do any activities that we do, to be able to, to, to support the pastor or, or, and the deacons and whoever is doing work for the Lord and keeping this thing going here. That is what the tithe goes to. It goes to support this church. That is the purpose of it, which is different than either giving alms or taking up one of these collections and giving it to, to missionaries. Now, Matthew chapter 6 is referring to alms. So we're going to read a little bit about that because this is another place that people will turn to to try to disprove, oh, see, you don't have to pay tithes because, and they'll point to this and say, and they'll, they'll turn to this passage about giving alms. Giving alms is like giving charity to somebody. It's helping people out. 
And I don't have this in my notes, but in the book of Acts, there is a man, it says he was asking alms outside of the gates of the church. So when Peter and John were walking by, this man asked alms for them. He was asking for a hand. He was asking for some money. I mean, we see homeless people doing this all the time. They're asking alms. They're asking for help. They're asking for some kind of money. And this guy was outside the church, and that's what Peter said, you know, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, you know, stand up and walk. Because the guy was lame. The guy, the guy had problems. He wasn't able to walk, and that's why he was begging and asking for money. He was asking for alms. He was asking for help. That's what alms are. It's when you're individually helping somebody out. And again, that is voluntary. That is something that you can choose to do. It's not compulsory. It's not required of you to give alms to people that are in need, but it is a good thing to do. It's something that the, that the Bible speaks highly of doing, of being able to help people out that are in need. Look at verse number one of Matthew chapter six. This was Jesus Christ teaching here. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly." Now, people will turn to this and say, see, if your left hand doesn't know what your right hand's doing, then how can you take 10% of your income and give that to the church because you're going to know exactly what you're doing, right? Your left hand and your right hand are both going to know what you're doing because you're actually calculating and doing 10%. This, it, alms are not tithes. This is giving an alms. This is just, you know, it would be like someone asks you on the street for money. They ask you for alms. You reach in your pocket and you just pull out whatever and just give it and say, here you go, brother, bless you. I'm going to help you out. And, and it's not, you're not like doing, you know, you, you're, you're giving from your heart. You're giving what you can. You're giving because you love it. And, and you're not sounding a trumpet. That's what he says. The hypocrites, when they give to charity, I went over this in 1 Corinthians 13. We went over the charity chapter. You think about the, the Bill Gates Foundation or the Ford Foundation or all these, these great big corporations and they give money to, to charities, right? These great anthropologists, these people who they want to be known and what they do is they sound the big trumpet and they'll get the, the TV station there and they'll, they'll, they'll record all this stuff of the money that they give to help people out. And it's not because they care about the people, it's because they like the, the public relations. They like to be seen of men. Oh, they're doing all this great work for, they're, they're really helping people out. So they sound the trumpet, they make sure as many people know as is possible. If they're gonna be putting money towards something that's charity, they want the whole world to know about it because it makes them look good. And Jesus says, look, you've got your reward. If that's what you're doing, you just want people to think highly of you, and say, oh, wow, look at that guy. He's, he's so generous. He's giving money to people. That's not the point at all. You've completely missed it. He's saying, look, when you give your alms, just do it in secret. Nobody needs to know. Even if you give a lot, no one needs to know. You keep that secret, God will reward you openly. So God sees what you do, and God will appreciate that, and God loves that when you can look on someone, and you, could, you, don't, have to tell, you don't have to tell anybody. You don't have to tell anybody. Just... If you feel like, like you want to help someone out and give them alms, then do it. Don't try to be making yourself look good in the eyes of other people, though. That's not the point at all. But that's what the Pharisees did. That's what the hypocrites do. Because all they care about is that praise of men and that glory of men. But again, that's alms. That is not the tithe. 1 Timothy 5. We're not going to turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 14. This is the only place we're going to turn to about the tithe. There's plenty of scriptures about the tithe. Most of them are in the Old Testament. But what we're going to see here in the Old Testament is confirmed in 1 Timothy chapter 5. When in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it goes over the role of, that the church has for caring for the widows within the church. And it gives the qualifications. Just say, okay, if a, you know, a person... 
uh, let the widow not be taken into the number under three score years old. So a widow has to be 60 years old, having been the, the wife of one husband, you know, if she was if she had hospitality, if she washed the same feet, and it gives all these different requirements, right, for the type of widow that, you, that the church is responsible for caring for. If you think about an older widow, an older woman whose husband has died, is not able to provide for herself. She's not going to go out there and work. She needs to be taken care of. And the widow that the Bible prescribes is someone who doesn't, you know, they don't have any family members because your family is, is the first source of responsibility for taking care of people that have become widowed. Your, 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 your near kin should be there to help you out and to take care of you. But widows that don't have any of that, they need to be taken care of. Let's face it, they do. They're in, they're in great need. They need to be taken care of. And that is the church's job to take care of them. Just as it was in the Old Testament. The tithe is what goes to pay for the widows, the fatherless, the, the, the clergy, the, the, you know, the pastors, the deacons, whoever's doing the work for the Lord, and, come, and just running that assembly. That is the purpose of the tithe. And the tithe was never repealed. Its function is exactly the same as it was in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 14, look at verse 22. Verse 22 reads, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed, that the field bringeth forth year by year. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, to place his name there, the tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil, and the firstlings of thy herds, and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always." Now, I'm going to pause real quick right here and just briefly bring this up. One of the purposes for the tithe, he's saying here, is that, look, as God increases you, as he blesses you, you're sowing out in the field, you have cattle, and look, this is slightly different than the way we live today, but the concept's still exactly the same. However it is that you're earning your living, when God is blessing you, you're getting, you're getting much more you're reaping a lot more, right? Your, your, your cattle or whatever you have is, is having a lot more children and they're, they're multiplying. That's more wealth that's being added to you. God is blessing you. He's increasing you. And he says, look, you need to tithe on that and show that you fear God and that it's basically giving that respect unto the Lord of saying, God, thank you for blessing me. Here, every, of, all, of every 10 that you give me, I'll give you one back. Now, God requires this of us, but he wants us to be able to, to show that and say, hey, this is all from God. God is the reason why I have what I have. God has been blessing me, and I am going to rely on him, and I'm going to learn to fear God always. Because what happens is when people get blessed and increased with goods, they tend to get puffed up and think they have no need of God. But when you're keeping track... Because in order to give a tithe, in order to give a tenth, you've got to be keeping track. You've got to be saying, oh, I've got this much, so in order to give my tithe, it's this much. You're keeping track of how much God's been blessing him. And you're saying, I'm going to fear God, and I'm going to give that to him. Instead of saying, who needs God? Because as soon as you get that puffed up attitude, as we saw last week, you know, God hates pride, and God will bring you low. When you think you're so lifted up and, and high and mighty on all the work that you've brought forth with your hands, Instead of giving on God the credit for blessing you, he'll bring you low. Verse 24, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it. See, in the Old Testament, he was talking about the tithe. It's, they would bring in physically like their goods, like the, the, the increase from the field, like whatever they were growing, whatever crops they were growing, they would bring the tenth in. They would bring literally physically of their cattle. But he's saying, look, some people live much farther away. And he's saying, if the way is too long, it just doesn't make sense to be able to, you know, you've been really blessed. You can't carry all of this stuff. You can't bring it with you feasibly. Then he says, um, which, uh, verse 25, thou shalt, then shalt thou turn it into money 
and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, for sheep, for wine, for strong drink, or for whatever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household, and the Levite that is within thy gates. Thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. So he's saying, hey, if it's too far, Trent, you know, exchange it for money. Bring the money with you. It's a lot easier to travel with just money. And then when you get there, then you can buy, you know, food and, and everything else that you're going to, to give as your tithe. And then part what they did with the tithe was, well, you get to partake in that too. When you bring and pay your tithe, you get to, to eat of that meal, that, that, that you're, you know, part of that meal that you're bringing in to supply for the, um, you know, for the Levites. But it's not just for yourself at all. That's not the point. It says it's for the Levite and the stranger, so the foreigners that, that you know, don't have work or whatever and they need to be taken care of, and the fatherless and the widow. They all will come and, and partake of that tithe. And that is the same function that the church uses the tithe for today. So when we use the tithe, when we have our potlucks like we did on Easter Sunday, the church provided much of that food. Now, everybody brought something, but the church, out of the tithe money that comes in, paid for the ham, paid for other stuff, and everybody got to partake of that, including me and my wife and family and everyone else that was here. And if there were any other people, that, you know, they'd be welcome, if, you know, fatherless, widows, whatever, to partake in that. I mean, that's for them, too. It's not just for the people in our church. It's, definitely, it's for the people at church, but it's also for these other people. And, it, and that's what the tithe goes for. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 9, um, you have to turn, turn back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 16. We'll get back into the chapter. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. He's saying, you know, if you're disobedient to God in this, if you honor God with your substance, if you give him that tithe, if you give him that 10%, he says, your barns are going to be filled with plenty. Your presses are going to burst out with new wine. He will bless you. He will take care of you. And see, unfortunately, a lot of people get a lack of faith when it comes to tithing. And I know how stressful it can be to live on very little. To be wondering, man, you know, because a lot of people think, you know, I don't, I just don't have enough money to be able to give my tithe to God. I don't, I just, I can't do it. I don't have enough. And that requires faith of knowing that you're doing what's right. You're honoring God with your substance, with the first fruits of your increase. And he says, if you do that, your barns will be filled with plenty. He will make it so that you don't have to worry about this stuff. You show him, and I think it means even more to God when you are in those difficult situations, when you have mounting debt, when you have all these financial problems, and you say, you know what, God? I can't do this, and I don't understand how this is going to work. But I'm going to give you the 10% that you demand, and that will give you honor, and I'm just going to do it by faith, Lord. Please take care of me. I believe God will take care of you. The Bible says that he will. And you know what? Honestly, if you're, you know, with percentages, if you're only making a very little, if you have a very little amount of income, 10% is a much smaller dollar amount, right? If you're making a lot of money, then it's going to be a much bigger dollar amount. It's a percentage. It's not, it's, you know, it's just based on, on how much that is. So if you're making, you know, $10 a day, he's only asking for one. You get the other nine, and uh, and that's the way it works. But um, I I believe I'm not, and 
I've already kind of gone a little bit longer than I wanted to on this topic, but it is an important topic. And you know, this isn't this isn't being preached because like, oh, I, I just I just am money hungry and I want you to just give, 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 give. I just want people to be right with God. I'm going to teach the Bible and, and for what it says and for the truth. And this is what it is. And, and I believe that if we're not tithing, we're in sin. So I'm not going to hold that back from you. Just as much as anything else that I believe is a sin, I'm going to tell you about it. I'm going to tell you about all of it. So um, continuing on here, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 16. Wow, I'm in Romans 16, not 1 Corinthians 16. There we go. Verse number... Six. And like I said, there's those other passages you can, you can read up on, and there are a few more, but I didn't want to dedicate the entire sermon to this one topic tonight. Um, verse number six. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So Paul's basically here just informing them of his plans, and he has a full expectation that the church is going to take care of him. When he's going out there, he's saying, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out, I'm going to visit you, and it may be that I'm going to spend an entire winter with you, that I'm going to be there for some months. So again, he's giving them the opportunity, just as he did to, to tell them to lay in store for, for the other saints. He's given the opportunity to be able to prepare and say, okay, well, Paul's going to be here. And we need to take care of him. And that is the church's job and the church's duty. When you have other saints that come in and visit, the church's job is to take care of them. I mean, when we have people that maybe they're traveling around and there's missionaries and, and someone comes to visit us that's a, a, another child of God and they're doing the work of the Lord, hey, we're going to put them up. We're going to do our best to do whatever we can to be hospitable, to open up our doors, and, and, to, and to let people in and, and do our best to take care of them. And that's the right thing to do, and that's what's expected to do. And that's exactly what Paul expected for the church at Corinth to do for him. Verse number 9, For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. So he's saying he's going to tear at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? Because he's got this great opportunity. He says this great door is opened unto him. He says this is amazing. This door is just opened up. It's going to be effectual. I'm going to make a lot of change on people. He says, and there are many adversaries. And we need to keep that in mind. Always keep that in mind. When you are going to do a great work for God, when you can reach a lot of people and you say, wow, this great door of opportunity has been opened unto me, beware, there's going to be many adversaries because they're going to try to keep you from making that effectual change in people's lives. And that's all the more reason why we need to help support people like the Apostle Paul, people going out and doing the work for the Lord because they're, God's going to start opening opportunities to them. When they're dedicating their life to serving Him and they're going out and they're winning souls, hey, the more that you do for God, the more He's going to give to you. The more He's going to open things up to you. The more you're doing with His Word, He's going to give you more. Yea, unto whom much is given of the same shall much be required. When God gives you a lot, He requires more of you. So we just need to keep on snowballing on that and, and doing more and more. And that's what happens here. Paul said, look, I got this great opportunity. I can have a, a, a chance to, to make an effectual change in people's lives. But there's many adversaries. There'll be a lot of people trying to get you to stop them, stop them from doing that. We need to be aware of that, but it's another reason why we need to be able to care for those people and encourage them and support them and edify them. Verse number 10, Now, if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me. For I look for him with the brethren. Now he's giving him a heads up here and kind of vouching for Timothy and letting him know, hey, look, if Timothy comes through there, he's with me. He's a, he, he serves the Lord just like I do. He's a worker of the Lord. You receive him. You know, he better not be in fear to be around you guys. You need to be warm and welcoming and take him in. He says, let no man despise him. 
but conduct him forth in peace. Help him along. Help him get to get done what he needs to get done that he may come unto me. That's his, his direction for Timothy. And then verse 12, as touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time but he will come when he shall have convenient time. And then he informs him that, that Apollos is also going to come. He says he's not going to come right away. He said he wasn't able to do it right now. He had other things going on, but he does plan on coming when he's able to. And he's given him a heads up about that too. So that way, again, they're able to prepare to receive these men if and when they do come to their church. They know they're going to come. Okay, Timothy's a good guy. We need to receive him. We need to help him out. Apollos is a good guy. We need to help him too if and when he does come. And then he begins his last commands as he's closing up this epistle. Look at verse number 13. So he just tells them about Timothy and Apollos. And then verse 13 says, Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. So you need to be on watch. You need to be on guard. You need to watch out for the enemies. You need to watch out for adversaries. You need to stand fast in the faith. Be unmovable. Don't let people shake you. And all, this whole epistle is giving them all this great doctrine and teaching and, and learning. And he says, stand fast. Stand fast in the Lord. Don't be shaken. Don't let the, the distractions come along and distract you from what you're doing. Don't be moved. Don't let the problems and the adversaries sway you from your faith. Just quit you like men. Be strong. We need to be strong. Like a, like a man is strong going into battle and is not, should not be fearful in their heart, but, but willing to, to, to put up the fight. We need to be strong. We're in a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle. It's not physical. You don't, you don't have to worry about getting into a physical altercation with anyone. Don't worry. We're not, we're not um, Word of Truth MMA Baptist Church. We're, you know, it's, a, it's a spiritual fight that we're in here. But we still need to be just as strengthened as an MMA fighter would be getting into their fight spiritually. They get strengthened physically, right? Someone who's, who's getting into a, a boxing match or an MMA fight, they train all the time, right? They're constantly in the gym. They're constantly working out. They're constantly training. They're constantly trying to build their muscles, to build their defense, to build their offense, to do everything they can to be ready to win that fight. We need to be doing the same thing spiritually. Amen. It's not as easy as the physical part. Physically, it can be pretty easy to get into a workout routine and just start working out. We need to get into a spiritual workout routine so that we can be strong. We can be unmovable. When the adversary comes, we can be firm. We can resist the devil and he'll flee from us. But that requires a spiritual preparation. That's going to require you getting in your Bible, praying, talking to God, asking God for help, at, you know, thinking about others, doing all of these things, coming to church, being edified, fellowshipping with other believers, and, and, and getting strengthened and built up for the spiritual fight that we're in because there's going to come a time when, if it hasn't happened already, that the, the adversaries will come. They'll try to, to get you ashamed of what you believe. They'll try to get you to... to back down on, on whatever you know, stand you're making. They'll try to make you feel stupid, ignorant. They'll pull all kinds of tricks out on you to, to get you to, to shut your mouth and to back down and to, and to shake your faith. We need to be ready for that and strong. You need to be, be willing to think, no, 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 what they're saying isn't right. I already know this. I'm expecting this. I've, I've prepared. I've trained for this. I know God's word. I know that what they're saying is a lie. I know that this is going to happen. I know that um, the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself said uh, that you're blessed when men shall revile you and shall curse you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for his name's sake. He says, Rejoice ye and, and leap for joy in that day, for great is your reward in heaven. When you get all these attacks and people are lying about you and trying to drag your name through the mud because you stand for Christ, not because what they're saying is true, but because you stand with Christ, because of the stands that you take, because you believe the Bible to be true, you've got a great reward in heaven. That means you're doing something right.
It really does. And, and, and it's to the world, you're going to think like, what do you mean you're doing something right? you got people hating you. In God's eyes, you're doing, you're, you're doing what's right. You're not backing down. You're showing your integrity. You're standing fast in the faith. And then verse 14, just as he gets done you know, telling you, be tough, be strong, be like a man. He says, let all your things be done with charity. So in your strength, in your founded faith, in being unmovable, don't forget that the whole point is, is to have that charity where you have that love, where you care for other people. That's the point. That's the purpose, is to ultimately minister and serve other people. It's not just to, to, to be the tough guy, right? It's to show your faith and your integrity and, and, and holding to God's word, which will make an impact on other people that can see that. And that you're not someone that just rolls over, oh, how much do you really believe in I mean, think about that. How much do you really believe in something? If you say, no, you know what, like, like all these people that come out against the homos and, they, and they'll say, you know, these celebrities, but they're not founded really in the Bible. These people, they'll, they'll say, they just think it's weird and gross because it is, because it's just like a normal person thinks that's weird and gross. And they'll actually vocalize something like that. But then they have to come back and they apologize, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean that and everything else because they start getting attacked. Well, if you're a Christian, you say, you know what, I believe the Bible and I think that's wrong. And then you start getting attacked and you're like, oh, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what, maybe I should just love, you know. You're going to have no respect. People aren't going to want to listen to what you have to say because you're not being consistent. You're not, you're not believing God's word. But when you could withstand the attacks and just say, you know, I'm not going to budge on this because this is what the Bible says. I mean, this is what God's word says and I'm just going to believe it. And I do believe it and it's right and you're wrong. Because this is the word of God, and that's just your opinion. And when you can have that type of a faith and that steadfastness, people will look at that, and even people that disagree with you can at least say, well, at least you're being consistent with what you believe. And have a lot more um, consideration for what you say then when you're consistent in your belief. Let's finish up the chapter here, verse number 14. Let all your things be done with charity. I just went over that. Verse 15, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Now, this is kind of my last main point for this sermon, is this, this, uh, what we see here about the household of Stephanus. So what we see here is this household. It says it is the first fruits of Achaia. Achaia is a region, it's an area. So there's a church in Achaia that had won the household of Stephanus to the Lord. And this household of Stephanus now have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I mean, this is like, you talk about an addiction, right? We all know what an addiction is. You just, I mean, they just can't stop, right? But they can't stop serving God, ministering to the saints, doing what's right. Man, the household of Stephanus is on fire for the Lord. What a great thing to just say, hey, they're the first fruits of Achaia. And what does that say about Achaia? They're doing something right. They are following the great commission of not only getting people saved, because I'll tell you what, Getting people saved is awesome and praise the Lord for it. And you, you have made a huge difference, all the difference in the world in that person's life when they were headed for hell, but that now they're going towards heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And that is great. And I'm all for it. That's what we do. But I'll tell you what's even better than that is when you can continue on with those people and help them to grow and to learn and to get them plugged in and to get them to the point to where they're addicted to doing the same work. When you can invest in somebody to do that type of a job, to do the same thing that you're doing maybe, now you've multiplied because not only are you going out in regionals, now you've got someone else that's going out and doing the same thing. See, if you never are able to bring people to that point where, I mean, you're, you're only going to see as much fruit as you can, you can do individually. But when you can help teach and train other people to do the same thing, now your influence and the fruit 
that you're going to receive extends out to all of these other people that are able to go out and do the work also. It's not just limited to what you can do. And that's why Jesus wants us to go out not only to preach the gospel, definitely to preach the gospel, not only to do that, but to teach and to disciple and to help people along and to teach them how to become a soul winner also. And that says a lot to Achaia, who brought forth you know, their first fruits of Stephanus. And Stephanus, the household of Stephanus, have addicted themselves to the ministry. They got on fire, and they're just like, we, we love serving. We love serving the Lord. We love serving people. And then look what it says in verse 16. He just brings up in parentheses the household of Stephanus and how they've addicted themselves to the ministry, that ye, church of Corinth, submit yourselves unto such. Who's the such? The household of Stephanus. Unto those type of people. The people who are on fire. The people who are addicted themselves to the ministry. Hey, you submit yourselves unto them. You should identify people who are doing such a great work for the Lord. Submit yourselves unto them. Help those people out. He says, unto everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. Identify the laborers for Christ. Identify those people. Help them out. Those are the people that you need to be ministering to. Those are the people, you know, the people who are the sowers that are going out to do this work. If you're going to help anybody out, hey, help those people out. Help them to do their job better. Those are the people that you need to be submitting yourself to is what he's saying. It's going to help them to get their work done even more. Sorry, there's a point I wanted to bring up. I want to make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself because this is exactly where I want to bring this up. These people have addicted themselves to the ministry are the people that we need to be ministering to. Now, think about this for yourself individually. When you come to church, do you come to church with the expectation that everybody should minister unto you? Do you come here to just take, 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 take and say, well, that's what church is here for. I need the church to do this and you need to get me through the week and you need to help me with this and you need to do this. and you, you know. Or do you come here with the attitude of what can I give? How can I help? What can I do to serve as opposed to being served? It's interesting, usually the people that do come in with the attitude of just, and I'm not saying we have any you know, people like this in our church, it's just something for you to consider and to keep in mind, that when you come here just, just expecting, expecting to always be served and be ministered, and look, I'm not saying, if you have a need, let us know about it. We want to serve, we want to help. So I'm not trying to, please don't take this the wrong way, because I'm not trying to, um, to um, uh, you know, cause people to feel ashamed or guilty or anything like that when you need help. That's what the church is here for is to help. I'm just speaking to a type of an attitude of people that want to come in and just take, 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 take and just don't really want to do anything for God and they don't want to serve in any way and they just want to come in for the, the, the taking, right? Because normally the people that do that, they, they, they're not doing any of the work and they're not looking to help serve those that are doing the work and to minister unto them. And we just need to make sure that our hearts are right and that when we, you know, as a church, we're all members. And I've gone over this in the past also through this, this great book of 1 Corinthians, how we all have different gifts, we all have different abilities, and we all have ways that we can serve the body. We have functions to perform. Ways that we can help the entire body. This church is a body. We all have a little bit different function to do, but we should all be looking to see how can we help. Now when parts of our body are, are in need, you know, when, when, I, when I cut my hand, there's a need there. You know, the rest of the body's going to come together. We're going to bandage this up. We're going to get this thing healed. The, you know, the brain's going to be sending out the, 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 the white blood cells and other things that help to help to fix that, to bring it back to full potential. Our church will do the same thing. When you've got a need and, and there's a problem here, hey, we all have a problem. We're going to help fix that. So don't, you don't have to keep that a secret. But the mindset should be, 
I want to serve God and this is what I can do and this is what I'm going to bring to the table. This is how I want to serve and to minister and to, and to help other people out. And just having that mind of, of esteeming others better than yourself. That's the mind that Christ had. That's what all of us should have that mind within this church. So let's keep reading here. Verse number 17. We're almost done. Verse number 17. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. For that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied. And it, it says, um, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. Now, I, this is great to be visited by fellow believers. I love it when we have people come and visit us that are saved, that are other believers in Christ, and, and it's just refreshing. It's refreshing even when we go out soul winning and you know, you're talking and you're talking to people that don't have anything to do with you and maybe people are cursing you out and then you run into someone who's already saved and it's just, you, know, you run into a brother in Christ. It's like, oh man, that's refreshing. Amen. It's just nice to run into people. It's like, wow, you're saved too. We're brethren. And you have that immediate just family right there. And, and it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and Paul's here saying, you know what, it was great to be visited especially though by like, you remember the household of Stephanus? They've addicted themselves to ministry. He says, I'm glad at the coming of Stephanus. He gets it, man. He's on fire. Not only is he a believer, he's a brother in Christ, but he's serving the Lord. He's working with me and we're working at something together. And that's great. We run into fellow laborers. Praise the Lord for that. He says, they have refreshed my spirit. It's an edification. It helps you to keep moving and keep moving harder because I'll tell you what, when you're working and working and you addict yourself to the ministry and you're working and working and working and working and working, it could be a drain on you. It's hard. It's tiring. It's not easy. But praise the Lord when you get these people to come and then they visit you. And that's why it's important not to just keep to yourselves. You know, when you, when you go out other places, be a blessing to somebody. Visit them. When things are going on, you know, go, go out and, and, and be a part of, of someone else's ministry a little bit and, and help them out and help refresh their spirit. We all probably have been comforted and refreshed by people visiting us. And again, let's have that mindset of thinking, how can we do that for others? How can we refresh someone else's spirit? And kind of keep that at least in the back of our minds to how can we help someone else out and just be that refreshment to them to help them get through and to continue to fight the good fight. Verse number 19, the churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Now, I had a little bit more I was going to go into here, but I'm not going to go into very much. Um, I just want to point out the church that is in their house is brought up multiple times in the Bible. We see in the New Testament how, how churches, it was very common for them to meet in people's households. Our church started in my house. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's, it's, it's great. It's fine. It's, it's kind of the biblical way our churches should be starting. You get out, you start getting people together, you, you know, you, you, you're gathering where you can gather, which oftentimes is a household. But I'll tell you what, a church is not a building. A church is a congregation. It's a group of people. This church... We can all like, we can leave this building and not have this building here at all, and we could gather outside in a field or under a tree, and we would still be a church Amen. without any building whatsoever, without any physical structure, because that is not the church. These steeples that you see, that's not a church. It's just a building. It's just a place where we can get out of some of the elements outside and, and, and have you know, temperature control or whatever and have some, some safety from shelter from rain and other things and we could gather together. This, is, this building is not the church. This is just an office building. The church is the gathering and they can meet anywhere, but there's a house church movement out there that think that because they see phrases like this in the Bible that, well, churches can only meet in houses and that's a ridiculous statement too because it's not about the building. Yes, they had churches in their houses, but they also had church in the synagogue. When a lot of these Jews got saved, some of the synagogues were turned into New Testament churches. And they just used the same building that they were in. So what? It doesn't matter about the building. And they were able to hold a lot more people than a house can. And that's one of the reasons why you, you know, hopefully you grow out of a house where you're, you know, you're starting to get more and more people coming Oh, okay, well, now we've got to move out and move somewhere else because the house isn't big enough. And we want to grow. We want to reach more people. We want to get this church to be bigger. 
Because that means we're reaching people. We're teaching more people. We're instructing more people. We're getting more people saved. That is what we want to do. Absolutely. But let's finish up here because I know I'm running a little bit longer than I expected. Verse number 20. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. And we, we ought to be a friendly church where we greet one another. We care about one another. We honestly just, you know, say hi. How are things going? How are you doing? Want to know about what's going on in people's lives, just their wellness and general well-being. And Paul's saying here, hey, greet, greet each other. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, their culture is a little bit different. I don't, we don't really have that as part of our culture for kissing people, but some cultures still do today. You know, European cultures, they'll, they'll do the kiss on each side of the cheek or whatever. Um, it's not really part of ours. But the, the point here is the greeting. The, the caring for each other, right? Not just, you know, I've been to churches before where it's like very unfriendly. You know, you walk in, no one really says hi to you. You kind of get some stares and some looks. And that is not the way the church is ever going to be. Not as long as I'm going to be pastor, as much as I can help it. We need to be, and we are. And, and this again, this is not a knock on anybody here because I've already noticed this. When we have visitors come in, people are always friendly and talking to them. And this is the way that we ought to be. And this is the way that we need to continue to be. Not just with visitors, also with, with other church members. We should know a little bit about everyone in the church because we are a church family here. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ought to be caring for each other. Verse number 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with my own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now that last phrase here I want to point out, verse 22, is the last topic I'm going to hit on. Anathema maranatha. One of the very few places in the Bible where you're going to see words that are not translated into English. You say, anathema, what does that mean? Anathema maranatha. What it basically means is if anyone doesn't love Jesus Christ, then let him be anathema is like cursed. Let him be accursed. And maranatha is um, the Lord cometh, or you know, it's to come, you know, the Lord's coming. So let him be accursed, God's coming. That's basically what that means. Now, unfortunately, church, you know, Christianity today, the establishment of Christianity today, we'll look at that and be like, <gasps> they're probably glad that this is anathema maranatha and not actually saying, let them be accursed. Because Christianity doesn't seem to be able to handle that. It'd be like, that's not very Christ. I want the world to say, well, that's not very Christ. What do you mean you're cursing somebody? How dare you curse somebody? Well, actually, it's biblical to have this type of an attitude. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to see another example of this, of a righteous example of saying, you know what? Let them be cursed. If they're going to hate God, if they want have nothing to do with God, if they don't love God, if they don't love Jesus, let them be cursed. Let them be anathema maranatha. God's going to come back and take care of it. Let them be accursed. Amen. Galatians chapter 1. And then we're going to, we're, I'm going to read verses 8 and 9 and then we're going to turn to Psalm 109. Psalm 109 is the last place we're going to turn. And it's very important that we, that we read that Psalm, um, Psalm 109. But Galatians 1, look at verse 8. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. See? <gasps> but I thought we're not supposed to let anyone be accursed. That's how the Bible says. If someone comes bringing a false gospel... And I'll tell you what, this is the reason why when the Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on my door, I will try to give them the gospel. I will give them one or two verses like the Bible says, but a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, and not only that, I will let them be accursed. 
Because they are going around and bringing a false gospel that's based on a works-based salvation. They have another Jesus, which is not God in the flesh. They don't believe in the resurrection. They are damning people to hell with their damnable heresies. And you know what? Before they leave my house, if they're not going to listen to the word of God, I'm, I curse them out. I let them be accursed. I let them know that they're going to hell and that they're sending other people to hell and they need to stop what they're doing and, and get out of here. That's what I do. Paul said, let them be accursed. If they come bringing another gospel. Now, this isn't just any unbeliever, right? I mean, a lot of unbelievers, they don't go preaching any gospel. They don't go out trying to convert people. But when people are actively out converting people to the false satanic cult of, of Jehovah's Witness or Mormon or whatever, and they have this false gospel that sends people to hell, Paul says, yeah, let them be accursed. If anyone loved not the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? Let them be accursed. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 108, or 109, excuse me, Psalm 109. Last place we're turning, Psalm 109. You say, yeah, but that was just the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote the Epistle of Galatians and in 1 Corinthians. It's not just the Apostle Paul. I'll read this for you. This isn't in my notes, but in the... In the book of Acts in chapter 1, Judas was replaced from being uh, a, a, an apostle, right? One of the 12 disciples, because he was one of the 12. And uh, obviously, he was the traitor. He was of the devil. He, he betrayed Jesus Christ, and he killed himself, commit suicide. So in the book of Acts, after the resurrection of Christ, they're saying, you know what? We need to fill this, this spot. There needs to be one of, you know, we're going to have 12 again. And someone needs to replace the position that Judas had. And as they were, you know, deciding between the two and they're voting, it, they bring up the Psalms. Verse, chapter 1, verse 20 says, For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. This is referring to Judas, his bishopric, his position, his office, his authority. Let someone else take that. So keep that in mind, that Psalm 109, because we're going to see, this is, this is the psalm, they talk about in the psalms, it's Psalm 109 that is being quoted here pertaining to Judas. Okay? Keep that in mind. Psalm 109, verse 1. And, and this is in regards to people being accursed. Okay? And Christians... And, and should Christians be calling people accursed or let them be accursed? Like we've already seen. Psalm 109. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without cause. For my love, they are my adversaries. But I give myself unto prayer. So this is a prayer unto God about wicked people that are coming after, you know, David. This is a Psalm of David. But more than just that, because this is also going to be referring to Judas. So the wicked that are coming after the righteous with no cause, and they're deceitful, and they're lying, and they're coming after him, and he's praying to God. He's saying, look, for my love, I'm loving them. I'm trying to do what's right, but they're coming against me. Look what he says, verse 5. And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. This is the prayer to God. There are wicked people out there that... A prayer like this is justified. Set a wicked man over him. Let Satan stand in his right hand. Verse 7, when he shall be judged, let him be condemned. 
and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and this is the verse, and let another take his office. This is talking about Judas. Judas was a reprobate, and I believe that this psalm is talking about people who are reprobates, people who are haters of God, people who have rejected God, they're evildoers, and that this type of a imprecatory prayer is righteous in regards to the reprobates like the Judas Iscariots of this world. To be able to, to pray a curse on them from God. Let another take his office. Look at this, verse 9. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth, because that he remembered not to show mercy, but persecuted the poor and needy man, that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. And it continues on and on. We're not going to read the entire psalm. It's a curse. He's not praying anymore for their forgiveness. Right? You remember Moses, when the children of Israel were even against him, and willing to put him to death, Moses interceded for, him, for them. He didn't want God to destroy him. He, he said, give him another chance. You know, let's, let, let, let's not do this. And we ought to have that attitude, but there comes a point with the wicked doer, with the reprobate, with the people who are just the, 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 filth, the, the, the filthy, perverted reprobate, where this is justified. The Judas Iscariots that, that have rejected God, rejected Christ, they're devils. This is a righteous prayer unto them. And we need to just keep that in mind. Now, again, it's not the majority. It's not like you should just be having these thoughts against everybody or, or even necessarily your enemies. But the Bible says in another psalm, you know, have not I hated them that hate thee, O Lord? I hate them with a perfect hatred. It's, it's those, see, it's not your enemies, but it's the enemies of God. It's the people who hate God. They're the ones where this type of an attitude and this type of a cursing is justified. Because the Bible says to love your enemies. You should love your enemies. People who are against you personally. People who, who are, are just, you know, for whatever reason, because there are lots of reasons why you may have an enemy. But the people who are the enemies of God, it's justifiable to, to have a cursing towards them. And look, this is what the Bible says. We need to be able to reconcile all the Bible together. It needs to all fit. If it's God's perfect word, there can't be contradictions in it. There's not contradictions in it. It's just people have too much of an imbalanced view of a, of a Christianity that's just all lopsided to, on the love side, right? And, and the, the cushy feeling side. But it's, that's not a balance, not a proper view. We need to have a proper hatred for sin and for the wicked. There needs to be a proper hatred there. It's not just the sin. It's the wicked. The wicked people. Not just the sin. That, that love, love the, hate the sin, love the sinner is a quote from Gandhi, who is not a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ. He mocked Christianity. That is not from Scripture. That is not from the Bible. And I proved that in other sermons, but let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for this great book, the, the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians, dear Lord. So much doctrine, so much to learn, dear Lord. Uh, I, I pray that you would please help us to continue to learn and continue to grow um, closer to you and in, in understanding all these, these teachings. Help us to be founded in your word and in the truth, dear Lord.
pray that you would please strengthen us, help us to be strong and not to be pushed around in our faith, dear God, and that you would continue to, to build this church and help us to, to do the work you have set out before us and to win souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.